Lord, we look at the thoughts of Psalm um, 69, and we would ask that you might be pleased uh, to help us to understand it, that we might rejoice in it. In we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Recording is in process. Well, good. I guess you all know uh, if you missed a, uh, a lesson that Andreas and John put it up on their website, backtomybible.com, and so you'll be able to at least to listen to it. Let's see if I can. All right. Psalm 69. Um I hope I can get through this psalm. I have two things against me in that sense, that it is a long psalm in comparison to many, uh, 36 verses, and it also deals with a very um, difficult uh, theological concept which we're going to talk about as imprecations or imprecatory psalms. I know that's a $5 word and I will uh, explain it but it's when God comes and curses certain people or using the psalmist. So that'll be, uh, uh, I have to, to spend some time. Now, uh, I'll remind you that I did do that at our introduction, but that was probably almost three years ago, right? So we've been in the Psalms a long time. Psalm 69 is, uh, is one of the most frequent Psalms cited in the New Testament. Uh, it is striking because uh, it has many what we call imprecations, prayers against the wicked. And David is persecuted and he is suffering, uh, not because of any wrongdoing himself, but because uh, his commitment to the Lord God. And even his family and his close friends are not supporting him in some way because he speaks about it. He, his only hope is to pray to the God of heaven who might be pleased to deliver him. And ultimately, David is confident of his deliverance and dwelling in the land. But technically, this is a lament psalm, but because of the imprecations, which is the cursings, it may be labeled an imprecatory psalm. So as we uh, see, the psalm is applied to Jesus in many places. Um, many questions whether David wrote the psalms among the literature. Uh, Ross, which I always read, he was one of my professors who taught me Hebrew. Uh, whatever the occasion he quotes for the psalm was and however it might have been adapted for later use, its basic message could fit many different periods, and this lack of specificity simply underscores the continuing relevance of the message. I could say much more about the introduction, but my time will not allow me. I hope that helps just a little bit. This is the outline of the psalm, a cry of deliverance, an appeal to the Lord God, a petition of salvation and a confidence in God. That would be your psalm in totality in a short little outline. Now let's get into the psalm itself. And the first, as I said, is a cry. He, he is suffering from the enemy and he's suffering without a cause. Uh, and, and I love the way he gets right down to it. Save me! I mean, he comes right out of the box uh, knowing what he needs. Oh, God. Uh, he knows that ultimately nobody else can save him. Uh, no one else can help. And so his desperate condition, uh, uh, he just comes right out of his petition, uh, save me. And then he goes into a motif of water and the mire. In other words, he begins to give illustrations of uh, what would happen that you yourself would cry out for the waters 
uh, verse 1, have threatened my life. It's up to his neck. It is, uh, it's, uh, he, he is in difficult situation. He's, he's using an illustration of drowning. In verse 2, he uses a sinking in the mire. Sometimes we call that quicksand, right? And you can't get your feet out, and you're slowly sinking further and further into the mire. And he, or you're finding a place where you have no foothold and you're just sliding down the mountain into a very precarious situation. Or the floodwaters, they're overtaking us in verse 2. Uh, it is over, about to overflow, and my, I'm up to my neck. So he's using these kinds of illustrations to... Um, uh, as physical to demonstrate his mental and spiritual and uh, uh, aspects of what's happening to him. In verse three, um, he is he says, "I'm weary with my crying and my throat is parched." In other words, he's not just crying out as the first time; he's been doing this for a long time. So he has done it to the point that he can hardly see. He's done it to the point that his speaking to God, he's got a raspy throat because of all of his uh, uh, crying and crying out to the living God. His eyes are failing. In other words, he's growing weary uh, in these things. <clears throat> he talks about his enemy in verse 4. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs on my head. Now, some of us, that might not be many, but David had a lot of hair, okay? And so, evidently, so he's using figures of speech like these. And those who would destroy me are powerful. What I did not steal, I then have to restore. Ever been accused of something that you didn't do? <laughs> I have a friend uh, at, at school that was caught, uh, they said, was on caught on tape of going into a Walmart and stealing something, but it wasn't him. And so he, he, he was accused of something that he wasn't even in the Walmart. Are you with me? I mean, sometimes you might walk into Walmart and somebody accuses you of something, but he says, I wasn't even there. It was somebody else. And even the, when they pointed out, he says, well, look, see, I'm, I, I'm this way. I, I look this way. It, it's a completely different person. And yet they, he still had to go and, uh, 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 and pay a lawyer and go before the law court and, and plead his case. And not only that, he had to go... To, uh, uh, after that, to expunge it from his record. And so David is speaking to something to that effect, that he's now having to pay for something he didn't even do that they accused him of. And uh, that uh, false accusation is, is, is put forth. And so now you feel... Uh, what he is uh, going through, the shame that he is uh, having and the dishonor. Notice uh, in verses uh, 5 and 6, or 5 through 12, uh, that we see the appeal uh, to the Lord. His confession in verse 5, O oh God, it is you who know my folly, and my wrongs are not hidden from you. David is saying that I'm innocent of what they're accusing me of, but I'm not an innocent person. I have sinned. You know my sin. And so David wants to, you know, when you, when you get into, into trouble and in situations and God gets your attention, you start confessing all kinds of things. I mean, Lord, I, I remember last year I, 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 I did this, and I remember I confessed it, but I just want to confess it again. In other words, you want to get it all out to make sure it, it, what's happening to you is not because of what you particularly did and God's still getting your attention. You may have the consequences of what you did, 
but you are still wanting to acknowledge. And so David is acknowledging uh, those facts. Now notice in verse 6, the phrase that's used twice, uh, uh, through me, through me. May those who wait for you not be ashamed through me. May those who seek you not be dishonored through me. In other words, don't allow me. Uh, he's going now beyond. It, 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 uh, God has so uh, grabbed his attention that he's thinking about, well, uh, I, I want to make sure that nothing in my life is causing any hindrance in somebody else's life. Don't allow these things to happen because of me, through me. So you'll notice that phrase, through me, through me, making sure. You know, if God really gets your attention because of a certain difficulty, you will, you will find that this psalm will be echoing what you will, you will want to do. Um, making sure that you're clean before the Lord, even though the consequences and the situation may continue. So in verses 7 and 8, he, he brings forth the cost of his persecution. He says, because of your sake, I have borne the reproach. This honor has covered my face. I'm afraid, brothers, that we're entering a period of time in our history in America that this may be the case for us, that we may have to bear uh, the reproach of God because of the society that's turning away from God. My question to you is, are you ready? Are you going to get angry, mad, and ruin your testimony? Or will you be ready? And even though uh, we don't like it and the reproach and the dishonor that we will receive, uh, it's not because we're guilty. It's because our society is going against God. So the reproach and the dishonor found in verse 7. Verse 8, the estranged from friends and family. Uh-oh. Look out here. Be careful. Prepare yourself. You know, you may do okay with those who are coming at you, but what happens when family and friends uh, come after you? He says in verse 8, I have become estranged from my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. So family is coming after, uh, turning against David. And in verse 8, estranged from friends and family, but in verse 8 he says, um, uh, this is a verse that's used not in a quotation per se, but in what happened in, to Jesus in John chapter 7, verse 3 and 5. So if you got a pencil or whatever, put down John 7, 3 and 5 there, or if you got see it in the notes there, because it, it, it speaks about what happened to Jesus. Uh, I say this because Jesus is going to literally, or the, or the author, like uh, uh, the New Testament, are, are going to use certain verses here in Psalm 69 to refer to Jesus as they come up. Verse 9 is uh, the, the, the first one. Um, uh, for the zeal for your house has consumed me. That's found in um, John chapter 2, verse 17. Um, then it says, And the reproaches of those who reproach you, God, have fallen on me. So I'm now taking the brunt of what other people are going against God. And so since I'm a, uh, uh, connected with God, I get it. And that's exactly found in uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 3 that's used. So these are verses are being used in the New Testament on these things. I wish we could turn there and have some fun there, but then 
you guys wouldn't be able to get to work because we would be long on this. So weeping and fasting becomes his approach in verse 10. Um, when I wept in my soul with fasting, I became, uh, it became my reproach. So even when I fasted, people began to persecute me because I was fasting. I, I became, uh, in sackcloth, it becomes a byword. They began to use that. Uh, notice verse 12, the, the drunkards that sang at the gates began to use my weeping and my sackcloth as part of their song, a part of their scoffing at me. So even the lowliest of the people of the society uh, are beginning to persecute and to come at David in his situation. In other words, he, in, a, in a sense, he has no one to turn to. Family, friends, enemies, even those of the lowest of life that everybody usually hurls accusations at them are now throwing it at him. I hope you are getting the picture of how low David is how difficult this time is. You will find at times this may be you. Um, and this psalm will come very special in your life. In verses 13 through 18, as we turn to the third section of the petition of salvation, uh, our petition of deliverance brings complete devastation and disgrace on the world that hates and persecutes you. And he begins with a petition in verses 13 through 18 to deliver him from imminent death. So it wasn't just a piling on. It wasn't just words. There were also physical death was a possibility. So notice in verse 13, a contrast, but as for me. And you could miss that if you don't watch that. I mean, he's been talking about all the, 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 his condition, but now he brings out a contrast here. In spite of the reproach and the attack, his prayer is at the time of favor before God. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, literally from the Greek text, a, a, a graceful time, a, a time of grace, a time of favor before God. Now, this section is chock full of words that um, as you study the Psalms, uh, are uh, rich in redemptive words and great uh, comfort. Uh, notice, uh, I'm just going to read through and, uh, and point them out. But as for me, my prayer is before you, O Lord, an acceptable time. O God, in the greatness of your chesed. Now, how many times have I used that word as we've gone through the Psalms? Before you knew new people who've come here, the word chesed is the loyal covenantal love of God through his covenant. Because he has covenant with his people, his love is going to be with them. And so often translated as a loving kindness, I use the, the greatness of his loyal covenantal love. It wasn't not just love, it wasn't just his covenant, but is his covenantal love that's brought together and his loyalty to that. The people may completely go off, but his loyalty, well, I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. Even though I may have to spank you, <laughs> Israel, I'm still going to do what I said I'm going to do. And that is chesed. That is his loyal love. In the latter part of verse 13, O oh God, in the a greatness of your loving kindness. Answer me with saving truth. 
a word that could be either faithfulness and truth, depending on the context. It could be either one here. Um, but I, I like the faithfulness of his saving truth. Man. One thing that we have, we get the, uh, we get the word uh, in Hebrew, aman, which we get aman, right? We say amen to things. What do we mean by that? Well, it is true. It is faithful. Well, uh, he's saying this faithful truth. So God's covenantal loyal love and his saving truth is my meat and potatoes during this time. Then he says in verse 14, deliver me from the mire. He goes back to his uh, one, verses 1 and 2 illustration. Deliver me from the mire and do not let me sink. May I be delivered from my foes and from my, the deep waters. May the flood of water not overflow me and make the deep not swallow me up and may the pit not shut its mouth on me. These are interesting phraseologies. Again, we've already talked about them, but involved with that. And then in uh, verse 16, he goes back to some of the richness of his, uh, these Hebrew words that are coming up. Answer me, O Lord. Uh, for in your, here it is again, in your loving kindness, in your chesed, according to the greatness of your rachamin, your compassion. Oftentimes in, in Hebrew, the, the word chesed and rachamin, dealing with his compassion, his loyal love, will go together in, 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 in that. Do not hide your face from your servant, for I am distressed. Answer me quickly. Do you, can, do you sense his urgency? Oh, draw me near, uh, draw me to my, uh, oh, draw me to my soul and redeem me. Again, another uh, great Hebrew word, Gael, and then he's going to use ransom me. Same type of concept from Pada, mean from my enemies. Redeem means to um, I'm in, in bondage, and now God comes and he delivers me out of that. So draw near and redeem, ransom me from my enemies. And his conclusion, um, his prayer is based on the nature of God. For you know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor, and all my adversaries are before you. <laughs> this is a rich section. Uh, you, during the times of difficulties, uh, you, will, you will cry through verses 9 through 12, but in 13 through 19, your heart will be uplifted in, four, in 13 th uh, through 18 in the beauty of the language that is used here and the promises of the living God. His condition again, God knows his ill treatment, his reproach, his shame, his dishonor in verse 19. His condition in verse 20, a broken heart. He feels sick. There is no help. And he uses that right at the first. That's, that's desperate enough. But then in verse uh, uh, 21, he begins to use what is used in the New Testament they also gave me gall. The, 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 the Hebrew word there really is poison for food. Uh, the New Testament in Matthew 27, uh, 34, or Mark 15, 23, uses the word gall in that aspect, referring back to this imprecatory psalm. And then uh, vinegar. For, for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink, sour wine. Again, used in the New Testament for Jesus uh, here. So notice how they're picking up terms, the New Testament writers, from this particular psalm, we believe. And this is his condition 
as he speaks about it. <clears throat> then God will punish the persecutors one day. <clears throat> so this now in, um, switches over to uh, that particular section. And here's where we uh, get into the imprecatory section uh, of it. Um, May their table before them become a snare. Well, that's not too bad. In other words, um, uh, this would be something that would cause them a problem. And when they are in peace, may it become a trap. They think they're fine. God come toward them. Uh, bring judgment to them. Now, you have to realize, uh, I'll say this again in a few moments, that to go against David and the nation of Israel is to go against God. There's, God has only covenanted with one nation. Now, I agree, he's blessed the United States beyond measure. And uh, uh, grace has been thrown out at us. But he's never coveted it with us like he has the nation of Israel. And the promises from the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And so therefore, to go against David as the king sitting on the throne is to go against God. That makes uh, these statements a little bit different as we're going to see. Uh, may they become blind and shake continually in verse 23 when he says, May their eyes grow dim and they cannot see, and may their loins shake continually. Pour out, verse 24, uh, thine indignation upon them. May they, uh, your burning anger overtake them. Verse 25, may their camp be desolate. May none dwell in their tents. This is an army going after the nation to annihilate them. If they annihilate the nation of Israel, all the promises of God are failures then. God is a failure. That doesn't mean that Israel is without sin at times. And you know God spanks them too. But if there is no nation, if they're never back into the land, if the promises don't come true, then God is not true. His covenant is not true. And so, um, verse 25 and especially 26 is very interesting. May their camps be desolate. May none dwell in their tents. For they, are, uh, they have persecuted him whom you yourself have smitten. Okay? You're persecuting me, David, and the nation, though you, uh, uh, you want to annihilate, the people want, the, the enemy want to annihilate them. So in verse 5, he gives a why. Interesting. For they have persecuted him whom you yourself have smitten, and, and they tell of the pain of those whom you have wounded. They punish him who God has smitten. Um, and he, verse 27 uh, adds up the iniquity and do not give them righteousness. So now the imprecatory aspects in its fullness come out in verse 27 and 28. Um, do not add iniquity to Excuse me. Do you add iniquity to their uh, uh, to their iniquity, and may they not come into your righteousness? And then verse eight twenty eight. May they be blotted out of the book of life. Now don't don't put New Testament theology in that as it is developed further. He's just talking about may they be expunged from physical life. Okay. And may they not be recorded with, with the righteousness. In other words, let them be doomed. 
That's a little strong, isn't it? Uh, do, you, do you sense the conflict with love your enemy that we find in the New Testament? Well, you should, <laughs> because um, there was a shift in the New Testament, a shift from the nation of Israel to the church, right? It doesn't mean that God has forgotten his promise to Israel. He will pick that up again, as we know, uh, toward the end of the uh, tribulation period into the second coming into the millennial kingdom. But let's hold your place here, and uh, I'll have to do this pretty quickly, if that's possible. In Genesis chapter 12, in the Abrahamic covenant, this is where it is important as we would study is that you study within the context of the, the biblical theology of where that teaching is put forth. And um, in Genesis 12, verse 3, we have the Abrahamic covenant, and it says this, And I will bless those who bless you, Abraham, and your descendants, and, um, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So as you would develop this, and I don't have time to go through uh, um, Leviticus. I put those down for you in Deuteronomy. That if uh, the nation obeys uh, God, the nation of Israel, then they get blessing. If they don't, they get the cursings for which he would have been on the unbelieving nations. So uh, that's why it's dangerous to take many things from the Old Testament if, it doesn't, if you don't understand what God has done differently or in a different economy in a church and, and, and uh, know the difference in the flow of how God has worked in different ways. Uh, we're no longer under the Mosaic Law. I used to take them to the cursings of my students and say, well, is this apply to you? My, and then I say, are you Israel? And they say, no. Okay, I said, that's good. You, 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 you've picked that up correctly. You're not Israel, and you're not under the Mosaic Law. Now, uh, there, so therefore, uh, these things are, are spoken to the nation of Israel, and so to attack on Israel would cause a curse to be on whoever's attack that God would be doing. And so David is ask, just asking that for God to do what he said he would do already uh, in his covenant in Genesis 12. He uh, uh, flushed it out in Leviticus 26 as well as Deuteronomy 27 and 28. Matter of fact, when I teach the prophets, I have my students read Deuteronomy 27 and 28 as in the introduction of the first class so they understand a little bit of what God and how God does things through the prophets of the Old Testament. Well, what does this come out to be? Well, let's look at some of, of the imprecatory aspects of the psalm. Um, uh, this is an, I hope you sense the difficulty here. Now I'm trying to bring forth the purpose of an imprecatory psalm, which is speaking curses against the enemy. I gave you some background of the Old Testament. Now I'm giving you some theological statement about imprecatory psalms. It expresses the standard of God's justice and righteousness for the people of God and the nation on the earth, and the wicked will not receive what the righteous will receive. That's kind of basic, right? God would be praised when his people are delivered and his enemies will be defeated. It will demonstrate God's sovereignty to all, <clears throat> some other important parts an attack upon Israel and the king of Israel became an attack upon God because of the unique chosen position Israel played in salvation history David's enemies ceased to be private enemies for they became 
the enemy of God. Notice these psalms do not take personal revenge, but justice against those who are against the nation of Israel. It's not personal to one to one. It's the nations that are coming against the nation. The cursing of the wicked seems best to be understood as coming from the blessings and cursing provision of the Abrahamic covenant. And many do not have a biblical understanding of the holiness and righteousness and justice of God who will and must judge the wicked. God is not obligated to show mercy and grace and love to any for all deserve the wrath and judgment. Notice the perspective of heaven when God comes in judgment in Revelation 19, verses 1 through 6. The heaven explodes because they've seen the injustice down on earth, and especially during the tribulation period, and God says, I'm coming. Well, when God comes, he judges. And there is four hallelujahs and one amen because God is coming to fulfill his promises and judge the people. I think heaven has a different understanding of the holiness of God and justice and righteousness. And I think we need to have a little more of that, but not personal revenge against people. Okay. Uh, it's important to remember that the church is not Israel, and Israel is under a partial hardening, in, as we see in Romans 11, though I believe the Abrahamic covenant is still valid. Uh, even though the nation may not be in obedience to God, you touch the nation, God's going to do something. Uh, now, AD 70, it was scattered to the four corners of the earth because God did it. He already predicted that in the Old Testament because of their disobedience. They used the nations to do it, Rome. Well, what are some applications that may have on this imprecatory psalm? And then we will quit. The most direct application of these psalms will be when God starts the 70th week of Daniel. We often call that the tribulation period. And the saints will pray for God to defeat the beast um, the Antichrist, we often call him, and all his loyal followers as they try to destroy Israel and the saints of God. You can read about that in Revelation 6 through 19. Uh, that imprecatory Psalms would have definitely applied then. For number two, if you believe that Israel today is fulfilling the restoration back to the land, the first restora uh, restoration, which will then enter into the judgment of the tribulation sometime in the future, maybe soon, who knows. Then when the nation go up against her to destroy her, the imprecation prayers seems to be valid, as you know. And finally, an indirect application of praying for love and justice toward enemies from the imprecatory psalms for believers today. What do you mean? We should pray that our enemy be converted and or turn from their unrighteousness. But if they do not, we may pray that God would judge the unrighteousness and defeat their ungodly and harmful deeds. We often pray that the Lord would come, don't we? But when he comes, he, he will rapture his saints and judgment will begin in the tribulation period. However, John still prays what? Come, Lord Jesus. So, um, the psalm ends in a, a, a beautiful section, but I don't have time. We better stop here and let me pray, and then maybe you have a question or two uh, on these things. So, uh, let us um, pray, and then I'll bring forth uh, a couple more things on that. All right. Lord, thank you for um, 
giving uh, us this opportunity to go through a very difficult psalm, but a, but a rich one. And I pray that the message of the psalm, which I'm going to give in a few moments, will be something that burns in our hearts, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I try to summarize the psalm each time. Because of the zeal for God and His house, the psalmist laments the reproach and attack of the enemy, his scorn from family and friends, and thus he prays for his enemy's defeat and his confidence that the Lord will answer his prayer and restore Zion and Judah to those who love his name. A possible application in the midst of physical and spiritual attack by the enemy, we should pour out our hearts to God who in his time will protect us and restore us. Well, I'm sorry I had to cram this in. I will go back next week and uh, 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 finish the psalm in one sense and kind of and be able to uh, uh, repeat a little bit of it because Psalm 70 only has five verses. So do not fret that I hurry through the last part. I'll finish up a little more on 69. So what are your questions or statements?